Okay, cool. Why don't Bill, you say who you are, and then I'll I'll take it over from that. I say who I am, and then you take it over from that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Does that work? Who I am. <laughs> Shut up. Oh. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi, I'm Bill Stevenson with The Descendants. And I'm Tim McElrath uh, with Rise Against. And um, we're here on day one of the Nowhere Generation tour. I mean, it feels like day one of, like, so many things because we're, like, finally, uh, the lights are back on. You know, like, and we're also here on day one of the Ninth and Walnut tour, which is our new album. We both have new albums out, which is kind of a fun coincidence. We've spent so many months, and I'm gonna even say years together, <laughs> but we've never done a full tour together with the two bands. So this is this is great. This has been a long time coming, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And like for people, like might be aware of both of our bands but maybe not aware of our connection of our other relationship our other relationship <laughs> it's bill um bill has and his studio the blasting room and everybody there have produced six is it six it's more than six is it more than six it's a lot of, so we've produced of their albums the majority the overwhelming <laughs> majority of rise against albums and music that you have heard is most likely produced by Bill Stevenson and the Blasting Room Studios. Is that fair? That's a fair way to characterize it? Yeah, yeah. and my partner at the studio, Jason Livermore. Yeah. Jason Livermore, uh, Chris B. Belanger, Berlin, everybody um, there. And so not only did um, our band, uh, the four of us in Rise Against, um, grow up listening to the music that Bill has created, but um, we've gone on to make uh, a lot of albums under his tutelage. And, um, and that's been really... It's been a long time now. It's been it's been really cool. And like Bill said, this is the first time. It's going to be 20 years next year. Holy shit. Yeah, so it's going to be 20 years. It was Thanksgiving cuz remember we had vegan Thanksgiving at my house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's going to be 20. It's going to be 20 years next year. Uh we I was joking with Tim one day we were working and I said I've probably spent more time just um like this on the on the other side of the glass in the studio you know the control room and the probably spent more time on the other side of the glass with tim like that than i have spent with my own children <laughs> same same here <laughs> sadly i bet you it's true sadly i would say too like that there's if bill and i were to work on a song there's a, a certain percentage of it that it was actual like physical work of like the singing and whatever. And then you being on one side of the glass and me on the other side of the glass, we spend a lot of time pontificating about like, say the song or maybe something that's kind of unrelated or something that the song kind of triggers in both of us. Or we get on tangents where like Bill finds, he'll find like the one like weak line in the song where like he can tell that I'm, I have, I kind of phoned it in a little bit and then we'll start digging the song apart and we could be behind that glass for like six hours sometimes just like putting the song under the microscope so Ele right? 11 hours on re-education through labor is that what it was yes sir oh god <laughs> hopefully it wasn't 11 hours of singing i don't think it well, was well re-education had some long long of those silent things you're talking about yeah where no one said a word for like 20 minutes and then i went Ah, oh, I got right. it. And yeah, then yeah. you go, nope. And then another 20 minutes of silence. And then you go, I got it. And I go, nope. And then another 20 minutes of silence. <laughs> so that's probably a fair way to characterize like um, <laughs> like how we've worked together um, in the past. And it's exciting to be here because we're finally we're touring together. We've maybe done some festivals over the uh, years, but we certainly have never toured with you guys, mostly because you guys have not been touring per se in the entire existence that we've been a band. So this is like your guys' first time back like on the road. Rise Against does real tours, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks. We, we've kind of turned into a dad band. We fly out on a Wednesday. We play Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Fly home on a Monday and lick our wounds and tape our fingers up. And then maybe three or four weeks later, go do that again. But this time we're out here with them for pert near, pert near five weeks. I'm really excited. It's going to be fun. It'll be cool to hear you guys rock some of those new jammers live too yeah i can't wait for you the to big old them. pa behind it you mm -hmm. know i'm a little nervous to be playing them in front of you but we will uh we'll overcome and we're gonna that. we're gonna play some songs that 
like the last time we played them live was 1979 because they're <laughs> they're from this new album night the walnut mm -hmm. which is all those are all our very very first songs and so some of these the last time I played them in front of people, I was 16 years old because <laughs> we quit playing because we got sick of them and wrote new songs, you know? That, I think, I feel like that's such a cool story too that people should know the, of Ninth and Walnut and maybe you could sum it up. because This isn't just like the new Descendants album that you are listening to when you go pick up the new Descendants album. It's actually got a far deeper story. It was our original batch of songs. It was our first 15 songs that we first learned. It was... So for me, it was the first, these were the first songs I ever played with a human being instead of just playing along with my Kiss records or my Stones records. These were our very first song. But by the time we kind of learned how to be a band, by the time we learned how to play our instruments, figured out kind of what we wanted to sound like, how to, how to book shows, how to, how to book a recording studio. By the time we figured all that out, we were sick of these songs and we wrote new ones and kind of moved past them. But then, then a while back, we, we all kind of went, hey, why did we never record all of our first songs? So we recorded them all and put them out this year. Yay for us. That's so cool. I can't think of an example of a band that has ever done that before. Maybe there is out there, but I cannot think of one. Because ben, bands didn't start when they were 15, I think. So right. We, you know, our attention span was, was a, you know, we had those initial songs and then a year later, we weren't playing any of them. Right. It was, just, it was, as, if they, it was as if they never existed. Because you'd probably written another batch, and you just sort of like moved on. And another and another. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then... Attention span guy. Yeah. And then I know we're supposed to talk about um, other albums as well. But oh, yeah. I, 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 but about I have more other... questions too. Like, did you have demos of those old songs, or were you just remembering them? Both. I mean, I, there's no way I could forget those, because they're okay. it's just yeah. those, those are like the most precious totally. memories of my life. Sitting there and... <laughs> I would do some drum fill and it was like the most mundane drum fill, but it's like, man, I'm the, I'm the coolest drummer in the world, you know, right, just, right. just like, so I'll never forget him. But yeah, we also had practice tapes and we had a tape of this, our very first party we played and we, it's got every song on it and mm. we, and it was the first party we ever played. So we had reference and we didn't change them. We right. didn't like update them or soup them up. I mean, we've all become more kind of better players on a technical level. We didn't try to put that into it. They're just, they are how they were. That's pretty incredible. They are how they were. And you're right. The first songs you ever write, like they stay with you. Like they're huge. They're huge hills that you climbed to like get there. And so you'll, they're, they're permanently yeah. imprinted on you. Like that, make, that makes sense to me why that would happen. Well, um, let's talk about the music that you guys put out after you wrote Ninth and Walnut. And uh, Consequences of Sound wanted me to pick a specific record um, from Descendants catalog that influenced... Uh, me, I know it's influenced my whole band. I chose uh, Milo Goes to College. Um, Milo Goes to College found me on like, probably I think its first iteration uh, was like a blank tape, like someone had like dubbed. And it was probably 1992, I imagine. So I was like going from like eighth grade into high school or whatever. And that was when everybody was kind of trading tapes. And it was like um, lots of just kind of like the gateway punk rock bands, whether it was like Op Ivy or Social D or Minor Threat. It had Fugazi on the other side. Fugazi was on that too yeah. as well. Yep. Yeah, like yeah. everything from like all the way to like Subhumans and Naked Ray Gun. Like it had a little bit of everything. I was in Chicago, so Peg Boy was floating around at that point. Um, and then my friends and I drove around listening to uh, Milo Goes to College all the time uh, to the point where like those songs are like imprinted on me. I know that they are imprinted on so many um descendants fans and i think i would have loved about it too is that there was most of the music on that tape of all the different bands it was music that took itself um very seriously you know and there was something about descendants that like um it was a combination to me of like music that uh it was almost lighthearted in nature it wasn't like super aggressive but there was still angst and aggression like in it that gave it like this bite that made it um i don't know really appealing to me and then very different and so i guess like what do you remember from that time like creating those songs where you guys fit into the punk scene at that time or if you fit into the punk scene at that time uh at all yeah the hollywood clubs wouldn't really let us play you know where the places where the germs were playing and x and fear and the alley cats and the go-go's and the weirdos and the screamers and the bags plugs they flesh eaters they 
<laughs> did I name every LA punk band? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, suburban lawns. But, <laughs> but the, they wouldn't really let us play. So we would end up putting our own shows on. It was usually a lot of times it was the black flag guys. Like Chuck would find a, a hall to rent and we would, we'd get one of our buddies to collect $5 at the door type thing. Mm. And we would just kind of put a show on because we didn't, so we didn't really fit in in our high school because we listened to punk rock, but we didn't fit in with the punk rockers either. Like we didn't have, we weren't, we never bought into the fashion part of it, the mohawk or the the studded thing or whatever. Mm. I, just, I, I, I don't have time for that, you know. Mm. But but um, so so we weren't in anything. So we kind of had to just make our own weird scene in the South Bay of. Basically, all these bands that just more or less got up there in their street clothes and played, mm -hmm. and they all kind of had, they all kind of had their own sound. When I think about one thing, when I think about the band, the late seventies punk movement, is I feel like it was, it was maybe far more diverse than people might might think. It was like okay, you, you, you know, the Germs sounded nothing like the Go Go's who sounded nothing like the bags, who sounded nothing like the weirdos, the screamers, fear, uh, descendants, Minutemen, Saccharine Trust, uh, uh, Black Flag. Nick, none, none of the bands sounded like each other in any way. So it was really, I felt like, I felt like I had somehow stumbled into this little weird art collective. And I was like, wow, this is cool. Cause I'm not really, talented enough to be an artist but here i am i've 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 surrounded myself with with artists so great good for me i can learn and i learned i learned a lot about music and we learned about music and we kind of found our sound we we were influenced by those three main bands in the beginning the last the alley cats and black flag and that's really that's the recipe for early descendants is one one third the last one third the alley cats one one third black flag that's like that's what we sounded like on Milo Goes to College. You can just hear it. I mean, you can just listen to part by part, Black Flag, Alley Cats, mm -hmm. the last, the last, Alley Cats, Black Flag. You just, it's just very, very much like that. And so, we, you know, we started by imitating. You imitate when you're, when you're first starting. So we, you know, we imitated. And, but eventually we kind of we found our own sound. We do, well, what the Alley Cats we were doing, well, we were doing it a little quicker and a little more, uh, uh, you know, aggressive and what mm -hmm. the last we're doing, we were maybe doing it uh, with a little, little more bite to it, a little more distortion on the guitar and this sort of thing. And so we kind of found our sound and we practiced so much, so much that when we, when it came time to actually record Milo Goes to College, <laughs> I mean, we just went in and played the songs. We recorded all the music in two days. And then we did, then Milo did the vocals on like a couple afternoons after school, just little four hour sessions after school. Cause we were, we were in high school. Yeah. Mm. And it was done. It was done. It wasn't like when you think of a recording, no, we just went in, we played the songs cause we knew them. If we messed up one, like I, a lot of them is just, we played it one time. That's the take that you hear mm. live, no overdubs, mm. but there were a couple that were hard where we played them twice. And then one, I think my age, I think my age, I had to have three tries at it to get all that, all that, all that stuff straight straight but mm -hmm. it was just really quick and the vocals were quick mixing was quick i think we just mixed it all in one day and there you have it kind of like us 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 having kind of found ourselves found our little sound so wait how old were you guys when you were in the studio recording i guess when we recorded it we were 17 ish okay. tony was older you know tony was older than we were right he still is mm -hmm. um frank is you know deceased frank right. passed away several years ago mm -hmm. but yeah we were, we were in high school we were juniors in high school that's so going from that i'm thinking about like 17 year olds uh recording the music for one of punk's most influential records in like two days right um and then do you ever look back on that as someone who went on to do become a renowned producer who has spent uh 
months on albums, including ours. <laughs> I, can I know nothing. <laughs> I can nothing. say this from personal experience. Is it ever crazy when like whenever when you're on like your fiftieth day with us? you know, making <laughs> like 15 songs or whatever it is. Are you ever just like, wait, we used to do this in two days. I like both. Okay. To be honest, uh, 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 the new one, Ninth and Walnut, we, we played those, we played them live. We had the ability to do multiple takes. So there aren't overdubs on mm. Ninth and Walnut. You know, again, we, we've, we've played a few of our albums live. We're not, I'm not afraid to do it even now. Like right. it's fine. But then we we edited some of the takes together a little bit, find, kind of find the best parts, like kind of how they do when they do jazz records, kind of kind of kind of that way. And then you know Milo overdubbed the vocals in Delaware. Uh, he's got a little setup in his house, and so I, I I'm okay doing it that way. But then I I like doing it the other way too, where you you know you get everything laid out, a tempo map, and you do the drums first, and everybody overdubs to it. I think mm. I think that can be cool. I think I think all of those different ways can be cool. It's just for some reason. For some reason, for my band, mm -hmm. I've never liked the sound of it being of of it being something that that can't be pretty much reproduced live. Like when people come see us, I want them to go, "Oh, yeah, that's exactly what that song sounds like on the record." And there they are playing it in front of me. I don't want them to go there and feel like like we left half of the we left half of the song back at home on some tape reel somewhere. And of course, I really don't like the idea of playing along with any kind of, you know, some of the bands are, they play along with pre-recorded, what do they call it? Tracks mm -hmm. playing along with it. You know, that doesn't seem right either. But that's, that's just me and my band, like my little punk band. I started 42 years ago and how I want it to be. But when I'm producing, then it's like, yeah, then the gloves are off and I'm doing, I'm doing, whatever kind of whatever I can get away with to make the song badass and it could be who knows what it could be could be layering up guitars could be bringing in bringing in string players it could be could be piano could be like getting a bunch of people in there doing gang vocals could be it could be anything really and putting laying baritone guitars up underneath the tenor guitars or Whatever it is, you know, whatever sounds good. I, I like all of it. I like things that are really simply produced, like, say, Roxanne by The Police. What do you got? A vocal, vocal, a upstroke guitar and a snare drum. You know, massive, huge song. Mm. And then you got Bohemian Rhapsody. I like that, too. It's, <laughs> you know, that was the most expensive record ever made at that time. I think that cost a million dollars to produce that record. They're both cool, right? Both mm. just as bitching as one another. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what, um, what I love about, uh, the fact that we came together, Rise Against and Bill Stevenson in the blasting room is that we, you know, we're, a, a band separated by eras in punk for sure. Like our band started, uh, many, many years later, um, as, uh, kids who were like very influenced by, the music and the world that you were from. Um, but when we came together, like we didn't come there, or you didn't have any like judgment for like like our era versus like your era, which I think is kind of like a staple of like a punk scene. Like, oh, it was better before, or like you weren't there or whatever, which you can find, I think in any kind of scene, you know? And I, I find that when we met you, you loved, like the sound that we were creating, you know, and like had like respect for the sound that we were creating, even though we weren't like trying to like, like, I guess like imitate anything, even though like all art, some of it is imitation. I think I agree with that, but we were just kind of trying to create something. And what, what was exciting for me is that you recognized like the feeling that we were trying to create. Cause to me, like if someone was just to listen to, Descendants and then to listen to Rise Against, you know, they might be like, wait, these bands are under the same umbrella, you know, like these are different sounding bands, you know, or how did somebody who was influenced by Descendants create a band like Rise Against? Um, and I think you'll find stuff in there, but like for the most part, it was like Descendants made me feel a certain way. And then I wanted to go on to create a band that made our fan feel a certain way as well. And that was important. And as long as that feeling was like, 
cut from the same cloth, I guess, then that was important. And that's kind of what I thought was so awesome when we met was that you recognize that feeling. Does that make any sense? You, you, you kind of just reminded me of something that's maybe worth saying. That era, like 2002, three, four, five, I can remember it being a, a kind of a, a, a big thing for me. So you guys came and a Wilhelm scream came mm. and uh, there were a few other audio karate came mm -hmm. and I, I kind of got, it's like it kind of renewed my faith in, in rock or in punk or when in whatever you want to call this music we play. Cause I, I was, maybe I had become a little bored or stagnant kind of thing where you find yourself listening to jazz records all the time. And I'm like, yeah, really? <laughs> yeah. And when they came and Wilhelm scream came and audio karate came and all of a sudden I was like, Oh yeah. Cause yeah. Cause punk rock just kicks ass and they're doing it right now. And I got mics on them, you know, just like, yeah. <laughs> and that's, so that was like a moment that was real for me. That, yeah. that was real for me. Well, and how lucky we were. Cause like you're, you, you realize in retrospect how those songs and those times that's, that's precious cargo, right? Those are like things that like you, that, that it can be, they can be bungled in the wrong hands. You know what I mean? And Wilhelm gave their precious cargo to the blasting room and audio karate gave their precious cargo and propaganda gave their precious cargo to the blasting room. And we gave our precious, like we, and we, it could have not gone that way. You know what I mean? And I feel so like lucky that it went that way. Cause you handled the precious cargo with like a sense of responsibility, but also like inspiration and all that was like, I mean, I've said it a million time interviews, but just forever uh, grateful for all that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really true. You're the precious cargo thing. Right? I think of some of those songs and what if some lame, <laughs> what if some lame dude recorded it and made it all <laughs> shitty? I'd have to go kill someone. It yeah. happens, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 it's like absolutely. Think, I'm thinking, I mean, it happened to our band. We had some lame dude recording us and he turned out all shitty. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it can happen to anyone. That can happen to anyone. So um, yeah, well, I guess we'll wrap it up here. Um, I'm here with Bill Stevenson from The Descendants. Uh, check out their new album. Are you calling it like the new album? What do you say when you call it? It's a new album. New album, okay. The songs yeah, were no just ever written a hundred million years ago. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. check out their new album, Ninth and Walnut, which is out. And it's like, yeah, I think it's, a, it's so cool because I don't think anyone's ever done that before. So I'm so super excited. It's like, a, just like in music, it's like a benchmark um, to like sort of dig these songs out of the vaults and play people like the prequel, if you will. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I'm stoked. And this is, we just thought we both just finished our sound checks. This is the first show of the tour. And I mean, I'm here with family. This to say Rise Against and I have a a working relationship is to largely, hugely undercut it. We These are my family. When I'm dying, the people that are going to be hanging out in, over me in my deathbed are going to be these guys and my guys. These are These are my best friends in the whole world. They're my family. Yep. Had to do it. Had to tear it up. <laughs> All right. I'm Tim. This is Bill with the Consequence of Sound. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Appreciate it, guys.